Good morning, everyone. My name is Shreyoshi, and welcome to this session on Bengali writers in Canada, in Canadian literature. And I'm very honored and pleased to introduce to you three of our very eminent and emerging, some of them emerging writers uh, working in Canada. So I'll uh, start with Sumaya. Sumaya, uh, uh, Sumaya, say hello. <laughs> Hi everyone. Sumaya Matin is a writer who is passionate about the intersection of art and mental health and explores themes of migration, identity, duty versus desire, and gender-based violence. So she deals with several of these in her, she has actually dealt with several of these in her debut memoir published in 2021 titled The Shaitan Bride. Sumaya is currently working toward her Master of Fine Arts at the University of British Columbia. In 2019, she graduated from the Humble School for Writers, a nine-month novel writing program during which she worked with award-winning writer Sham Salvadurai. And as you might have guessed, she is also a social worker and psychotherapist and policy programs professional with experience advising on a wide range of public policy files. She has a master in social work with a specialization in anti-oppression, which she applies in her psychotherapy practice and it does feature very prominently in her writing as well. So welcome to the session, Sumaya. Thank you so much. And uh, next you see Silmi. Silmi Abdullah is based in Toronto and is the author of Home of the Floating Lily, a collection of short stories published in 2021, which was also named a runner-up for the Danuta Gleed Literary Award for Best First Collection of Short Stories. She was born in Bangladesh and raised partly in Saudi Arabia and partly in Canada, and this diversity of exposure and experience is something that permeates her writing. Silmi is also a lawyer serving racialized immigrant communities, particularly women, and she has also been involved in a host of important law reform and public legal education initiatives. And needless to say, her work as a lawyer and public speaker has strongly influenced her writings as well, as we'll come to know very soon. And then, Sam Mukherjee, welcome Sam, uh, is a storyteller who, in his own words, loves to rescue people in loneliness with his books, talks, and workshops. So Sam was raised in India and obtained his degrees from various internationally esteemed institutions, including Jadup University, the IIM, Homeseglin Institute in Melbourne, and Vancouver Fil Film School. He has a higher education teaching certificate from Harvard University's Derek Box Center for Teaching and Learning and has lectured in multiple institutions of excellence across four con continents. He's an editor, speechwriter, and communication consultant working in Canada, India, and the UK. Sam is a prolific writer and has written over 1,500 feature articles ranging from personality profiles and human interest stories, trends, and in-depth interviews. And not to forget, he is also a very successful and much sought after creative writing mentor, popular with all age groups. So dear audience, please give them a hand and welcome them to this session. So I'm going to begin uh, with you, Sam. Um, so let's talk, uh, let's begin by talking about the perfect tangerine. 
uh, that, uh, sorry. So The Perfect Tangerine is Sam's third novel and it was released in 2014. So, Sam, how did you come up with the title for the book? It's a pretty, like, you know, unusual one. How did you come up with that? First of all, uh, thank you to the organizers for, uh, you know, organizing this wonderful uh, fest. Uh, thank you, Sreshi. Uh, thank you to Shubhrata Dash for inviting me and to this wonderful audience. Uh, uh, to answer your question, Perfect Tangerine, my third novel. This is my third novel. Uh, when I was writing it, I didn't have the title. And I was wondering, you know, how to nail the right title for the book, because that is always something that I think about deeply, because if the title is not interesting and if the title is not, um, you know, something that will catch your eye, you're likely to miss it in a bookstore. So, and it also has to be relevant to the story. So, there is a character in the book. Uh, she's a grandmother. Uh, she's in charge of the family, a very powerful figure. And uh, she has a thing with the sun. So uh, she wants to, you know, beat the sun because she thinks the sun is the most powerful uh, source of everything. And she feels she wants to feel more powerful than the sun. So every morning before the sun rises, she makes sure that she's up. And she wants to beat the sun at rising every day. And she succeeds. And she wants to see the sun in its perfect tangerine shape every morning. So, of course, it has relevance to other things in the book, but that's how I, you know, came up with the idea. Okay, that's wonderful. So, Sam, how, how do you know what to write? Uh, that's a difficult one, you know, because uh, so many ideas are always, you know, uh, in my mind, right? Because, like, when I'm talking to you now, I might come up with an idea. That's but right. how many ideas can you actually develop? You have only so much time. So, uh, the way I look at it, you know, I try to see which idea is repeating itself way too many times for it to be expressed. So when I find that, you know, there's something that I can't let go of, that's what I sit with. Because, like right now, um, I have three ideas and I think I know which one I will actually work on. Because I've just started working on my fifth novel and I'm already thinking of my sixth one. And I'm trying to contain myself because I don't want to jump into my sixth before finishing my fifth. But I think I know which one I want, because that's the idea that's repeatedly coming to my mind. So, uh, the most prominent one should be the one that one should pursue, I think, because that's where you will be able to do the most justice. Right. So, is there a recurrent theme in your work? Can you tell us more about your other works and how, like, yeah. is there a connection or...? Uh, it's interesting you ask this, because, you know, I'm always asked, like, what genre do you like to write in? So, my preferred genre is thriller. Uh, but, you know, my, my father was a journalist and he used to say that if you're, if you're really a good writer, you should be able to write anything. So, um, so, I've always taken that up as a challenge. So, when I used to work for a mainstream newspaper in India, uh, I was asked to do many different things also, although I was a feature writer. I began to write uh, many different things. You, you know, I even covered business stories, which was not my forte. Um, sports, which was not my forte. So I used to tell myself that when I was put in a spot, that, okay, if I'm a half-decent writer, I should be able to write that too. So, uh, so when I wrote my first one, Chopped Green Chilies in Vanilla Ice Cream, so this was a coming-of-age story. So I did not know what to write next when I was done with this. And then I saw an interesting news uh, article in, uh, in an Indian newspaper. And that gave rise to my second one, which is a thriller, and this is on human trafficking. And uh, so when I wrote the thriller, I said, you know what, if I could write a coming of age story and if I could write a thriller, then I must be able to write something else. And I wanted to test myself. And that's what I usually try to do. I try to write something which I haven't written before. Uh, so then I came up with Perfect Tangerine, which we just spoke about. And Perfect Tangerine is a fantasy, magical realism, and uh, I never imagined I would be able to write anything for children because that is so hard to do. Uh, because it's been a while that I've been a child, right? So, uh, uh, but the idea came to me when I saw my son being born because I was in the operating room 
And that's when the idea came to me. And by the time I came back home after a couple of days, I had the first chapter written on a piece of paper without even realizing it. So when I saw that, hey, I have the first chapter, so there was no way I was going to let go. I had to write the book. So that's how I kind of come up with the, uh, you know, to answer you. I don't know if I've answered your question successfully, but I try to write different things as opposed to, you know, what I've already done and uh, have had some comfort with. So I want to always, you know, explore the zone that is a little uncomfortable because I haven't gone there before. That's right. Uh, Sam, uh, something that uh, occurred to me right now when you were talking about um, how it's difficult to write uh, books for children, right? Mm -hmm. So have you ever given a thought to writing something for children growing up here, our children growing up here in Canada? Uh, that poses, mm -hmm. does that pose a, like, you know, the layer of difficulty, does it? To tell you the truth, I haven't uh, thought about it until the past 10 seconds, uh, but uh, see, when you pose a question like that, I haven't been a child in this country, right? right? So I have had many different experiences and I was a younger person when I was, you know, uh, traveling and I've had many different experiences, but, you know, to get the nuances of, uh, you know, growing up in a place where you haven't lived, uh, you, you can see it through somebody else's eyes, but if you haven't lived it, there are so many things that are actually amiss when you're writing. Uh, I mean, you can learn, you can, uh, television is a great way to do it, you know, like I used to watch a lot of television, so, which is why I was exposed to a lot of uh, uh, the Western world, but it's not the same, you know, uh, living and experiencing every little thing and every challenge, every hurdle, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a hurdle, like every experience, you don't have that when you haven't grown up somewhere, right? So, like my son, sometimes he will, he's 13, and he will be more uh, apt, you know, um, a writer for such a theme, uh, if he ever chooses to write, that is. Right, agree. But I don't know, never say never, because, you know, I don't know, because um, in a few years I might. You know, so mm -hmm. right now, I already have too much going on, so, but now you've put another thought in my head, so that's something else so to think about. So would you say, like, it's a general question to all of you, would you say there is a, like, you know, kind of, uh, disconnect or there is a gap uh, when it comes to um, South Asian writing, writers in Canada or South Asian writing in Canada for children, for children growing up here. They are like, you know, it's a unique position because like, you know, we certainly we heard so much from the panel that um, uh, took place right before us. This uh, and, and I'll be talking to um, both you ladies about that, our very hyphenated existence, right? Um, with multiple uh, identities. What about our kids? Like, you know, I mean, we, we certainly do always, I know for sure, I have a, a grade 10 and one who's in grade 10 and one who's in grade two. And um, there is this urge to, uh, like, you know, I mean, the books that I get here, of course, I'm not talking about the universal ones like Harry Potter and everything, like, you know, um, that's for all kids. So how do you, uh, like, you know, this gap between um, exposing them to our uh, culture, literature in our culture and uh, literature here, is there a gap or are we doing something about it or what do you think about it? Uh, is there a question, is this for me or for of you. <laughs> Since I have the mic, I'll be quick, brief about it. Uh, I think, you know, there is a gap because, you know, uh, I'm from Bengal. So we've grown up uh, reading uh, Tagore uh, and, um, you know, I've read the English uh, translated version of Tagore's work too. So when I get my son or ask my son to read it, um, he enjoys it in its entirety, but he doesn't get the... Uh, nuances of the language, you know, which is non-existent in the English translated version. Uh, so there, you know, like even in Hindi, you know, uh, we watch a lot of movies and uh, there are certain things I will get right away because there is uh, you know, history. Uh, he doesn't have that. So I will have to explain it to him and sometimes he'll be like, yeah, I got it. But I know he hasn't because he doesn't know it the way I know it. So there will always be a gap. Right. Uh, but you can still... Uh, be born here and, uh, you know, partake in a lot of, uh, you know, your past. Depending on how much you want to delve into it, how much you want to learn, like even the language, right? So I have, I know a lot of South Asian kids who speak the language fluently um, and I speak with them 
and I try to see if they understand their culture. And sometimes there is a big gap. And on the other hand, I've seen some children who are not as well conversant in the language, but they understand the culture way more. So, you know, it's a mix, you know, depending on the exposure and uh, how much the person wants to imbibe and learn. That's right. Yeah. Would you want to say anything? Yes. Sure. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm actually pregnant right now. So I've been thinking about this a lot. Yes. Just like, how do you communicate, you know, how, how do you, and how do you share your culture with the future generation? How do you share religion? How do you share, you know, the things that were, you, you considered strengths in your, your own life? Um, so I think there's tremendous potential and there's a deep need for us to have more of this kind of representation in Absolutely. children's lit. And um, when I think back to my experiences growing up here in Canada, so I immigrated here when I was about six years old, the stories about my culture, about my identity, um, those, the ones that really stand out to me are the ones that were embedded in relationships. So stories that my father would tell me, my grandmother would tell me, my aunts and uncles. And I think there's something about like oral history and the way that we share our culture through language, through verbally, verbal stories. And so um, it's through those relationships, um, you know, that I, that I would think about those stories so for example, you know, I, if I come across a challenge in my life, my father would always bring up a story from uh, like mythology or religion or a reference uh, a, a character in Bengali literature and he'd share that with me and then that's how that story would be embedded into my memory and that's how I would connect to my culture. So I think a lot about, you know, how, how can we find those um, connection points from uh, the parents to the children, um, whether it be in those conversations that they're having, um, you know, the stories that are being shared while they're eating food together, having a cup of chai. How do we translate that into written word, um, into images, um, in, in, in actual print books or e-books? So that's something I've been thinking a, a lot about. I think the stories are there. Um, they're just in, in, in the way that they are are kind of manifesting is through those relationships. And, and it's just about kind of figuring out how to share more of that. Great, thank you so much. Uh, this was indeed an important point, right? I have always felt the need for this. Uh, so one question, another question to you, Sam, before I uh, move on. Um, to uh, the others. Uh, so from the perspective of a creative writing mentor, how important or potentially therapeutic or healing do you think the act of writing is? Particularly for those of us who are, uh, you know, trying to navigate this uh, multiple identities, these hyphenated identities, Indo-Canadian, whatever, wo woman or um, Muslim Canadian woman, Hindu Canadian woman, whatever like multiple layers of identities, how does writing help it? Like, did you feel it in your, when you're mentoring? Uh, I understand the need for it uh, because, um, see, experiences are varied, right? So not everybody will have the same experiences. Like, uh, just to give you an example, if you're in a classroom and a teacher is, you know, uh, in the middle of a lecture and something is being imparted, not every student in the class will pick up exactly the same information exactly in the, they won't have the same visual. Uh, like for example, if you're reading a book, uh, let it, let's say there's, this, there's an action sequence. The, the way uh, you will see it and the way I will see it will be a little different, it won't be exactly the same. So why I'm saying this is um, I personally uh, have not had the need to, uh, you know, rely on writing to, as a, as a therapy. Uh, but I know that, you know, if you, are indulging in that, it can become a tremendous, like for example journaling, if you're journaling, I know a lot of people who journal, uh, it can be a tremendous receptacle for emotions, right? So, and if you're uh, in a traumatic situation or if you've gone through, or if you're going through a difficult time, if you're pouring it out all in a page without, you know, anybody else's knowledge, you're just doing it for yourself, uh, I, I believe that, you know, a lot of the, uh, you, know, you know, deeper emotions like grief uh, can be 
uh, tackled to a degree. Of course, it's not the same as therapy. You know, you you know, if you need to go to a professional, that's different. But it is definitely uh, uh, you know a thing to consider. Uh, I have a friend who's a trauma coach, and uh, I know what she does is you know the first thing she will do when she'll talk to a patient is she will give them a questionnaire where the patient has to write a lot about his or her experiences. Uh, so, and I asked her, like, why would you do that? You can just talk to the person and, you know, find out. So, she says that, you know, a lot of the cleansing happens when the person is actually writing it. So, uh, so by the time they come to me, they're a little light. And that helps them to, you know, kind of take the conversation further. So, um, so to answer your question, I personally haven't had the need to go all therapeutic, but, uh, uh, and it's kind of scary because I don't want to be in that space ever, uh, because my experiences have by and large been very nice, you know, so, but that's just because I'm lucky, I guess. I'm glad so. for that. <laughs> no, I meant to ask uh, uh, that, uh, like, you know, do you think that, because you've been mentoring creative writing sessions here in Canada as well, right? Yes. So, um, so participants, uh, do you think that they, like you know, they need the, uh, this act of writing, they need creative, like you know, I'm not uh, trying to segregate writing into any like you know genre, I'm just saying this act of writing, do you feel when you're conducting the sessions, do you feel that uh, they are here because you know, it's a kind of, it's an act of uh, healing, it's a ritual, that will help them uh, that way. Like, I'm just trying to understand that. Like, you know, yeah, I mean, if no. I were, sorry, no, <laughs> if I were a participant, uh, would I be uh, attending your session with the need to uh, kind of navigate my identity through writing, the multiple layers of my identity? Is that, have you ever felt that or like, you know, I mean, Yes, because, you know, when you're with an audience, and I have been with very large audiences sometimes, you know, without even realizing that the audience would grow so large. And, um, you know, you, you see that people come with uh, very different uh, interests and uh, they want to learn different things, they want to share the experiences and, uh, you know, uh, so, so there's no generic pill that you can give to an audience because uh, everybody will have a different need. So what I try to do when I go to a workshop, um, I wouldn't say I go unprepared, but I don't go too prepared. What I do is I actually ask people what they want from me. Because if I'm with you for an hour, I would want to make it count. I would want you to actually benefit from that, right? So if I'm uh, predisposed to what I'm going to tell you, then it's like a you know, ego trip with a captive audience, right? Because I'm in charge, I'm talking, you're listening. So I could just say whatever and just, you know, take my fee and leave. But that doesn't, you know, uh, that doesn't serve me nor the audience. So what I try to do is, I try to see, even if it's a large audience, uh, how I can help in that little time that I have with you. And if there is an experience which I can share with you, which you can benefit from, that's what I try to do. So, yes, to answer your question, there are people who come with the hope, uh, to know how they can vent, how they can express themselves, because sometimes people want to, but they're not a, articulate enough or they don't have the discipline to do it, right? So, uh, so if there is somebody in the audience who wants to do that, and they say that, you know, how can I go about it? If I have some experience which I can share, I will do that. Uh, but no generic pills for everyone. This is not Advil, right? So it's not gonna work that way. Everybody has a different need and they come for, uh, expressing different things. That's right. Thank you, Sam. And my next question is to uh, Silmi. Silmi, tell us briefly about your work and you know what, what perspectives or beliefs uh, do you think you have challenged uh, through your work? So first of all, thank you everybody uh, for coming and uh, thank you, Sirishi, for the questions and thank you for inviting me to this wonderful event. So my work, uh, so this is my debut collection of short stories. So it's called Home of the Floating Lily. And the themes that I explore uh, in this collection is, you know, migration and uh, the struggles that come with migration, the, um, I guess, the day-to-day -day lives of people 
who have made a new home in a different country and are grappling with issues like uh, family conflicts and you know very universal themes like love and loss and friendship. So it, the the context is specific, but the themes are universal, right? And so for me personally, I've always loved books, and I think books are a great uh, vehicle for doing that. It's is to convey the specifics through the universal. I think that's how we, you know, connect, that's how we build empathy for people who may not, or who we perceive to be not, I guess, not as similar to us as we think we are, right? So, um, so I've personally loved books that do that. So what I've tried to do in my book is just that, right? So I've tried to um, provide a glimpse into my community in the hopes that it will provide a different, uh, or portray a different side of it, perhaps, it, you know, uh, dispel some stereotypes about how my community is perceived to be. So some of the feedback that I've got from my readers, and I think, you know, those are the, the most, I guess, uh, gratifying for me, is that, you know, your, your female characters are very strong, or your male characters are very tender, you know? So, right. so, so I, I want to show those nuances that were not just one way. Right, so so that's what I've hoped and tried to do. I don't know how successful Wonderful. I've been, but yeah. Wonderful. So, uh, Sylvie, would you say that we are at the end of the day more alike than different? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> that's that's very hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> Although we like you know I've always felt that, and we have learned in the previous sessions also, right, that this constant dilemma and this constant uh, struggle between. Uh, who am I really? And I, I've always wondered, like, you know, do we really need to really bracket ourselves or uh, hyphenate ourselves uh, so, like, uh, so consistently? <laughs> On one hand, at times, we, I really feel that there is a need because I cannot dismiss my, uh, my experience of, uh, like, you know, being in a particular situation or or being in a particular uh, like scenario or society, right? But then again, at times I feel, no, this is like, you know, this is a emotion or this is a feeling that probably like, you know, whoever you are across the, uh, across cultures, probably get me <laughs> what I'm yeah. trying to say, yeah. right? Okay, um, uh, Sumi, uh, tell us about the Canadian connections that shape your work, particularly the stories like, uh, how, like, you know, what Canadian connections are there? So, I mean, the Canadian connections would be your Canadian the, the, the crux are, of the very right. foundation of my work, right? And we're talking about the hyphenated existence and hyphenated identities. Like, that is precisely what forms the foundation of my work. It's about the the various identities that we have and how do we grapple with those. And, you know, how do we kind of navigate our differences and, and similarities, what are the challenges, what are the joys in that, right? So, um, I mean, I've, I grew up, like, as, for as long as I can remember, I, I, I see myself, you know, I've been an immigrant, right? So I, I was born in Bangladesh, I left to live in Saudi Arabia with my parents at the age of one, um, so I've been constantly going back and forth between Saudi Arabia and Bangladesh, and then at the age of 14, I moved to, to Canada. So that, that is my reality, that's, that's all I know, right? This, this, uh, sorry, this hyphenated existence. So in terms, to, to answer your question, the, the Canadian connections, that is exactly what I explore. For someone, first generation immigrants, who are Bangladeshi, uh, who've come from Bangladesh and have made a home in Canada, who have raised children in Canada, what are their struggles, what are their challenges? So apart from the themes that you mentioned, would, um, uh, suppose, uh, like, you know, someone uh, like my daughter who's growing up here, would she, when she is mature enough, of course, uh, uh, would she be able to read your, uh, read your stories and find, like, you know, t connections that are, uh, like, you know, wh what I mean is non-thematic, like, you know, I'm in some reference, Canadian reference, maybe to some music or, like, you know, I, I don't even know what music they listen to now, but music or some, uh, like, you know, some restaurants, some plays, you know what I mean to ask, some Canadian reference uh, that is not, like, doesn't have to be thematic. I know you talked about the thematic uh, part. Right. So are there such references in your work? 
Yeah, so most of the stories are set in Canada, right? right? So I think there are two uh, that are set in Bangladesh and then there's one that sort of where the characters travel between Bangladesh and Canada, but most of them are set in Canada. So you will find references to That's neighborhoods in Toronto, and they're mostly set in Toronto. Okay. So you Wonderful. will find references to restaurants, you'll find references to streets, um, right. uh, areas, neighborhoods. So I, I am hopeful <laughs> that you know children who are reading this book or will read this book when they find it interesting enough to read it will um, be able to, will be able to connect at some define. level. And yeah. even if it doesn't connect to their own experience, hopefully they will find some connection to their parents' experience, because I do recognize that children who are born here to first-generation immigrants or who were raised here or who came here very young, their experiences are not the same as their parents, right? Absolutely. So they feel the hyphenated existence less than oh, yes. their parents do, yes. right? But I'm hoping that through stories and through stories like this and through, through books that talk about the immigrant experience, they will that their parents' experience will not just be an abstract idea or the countries that their parents have come from will not just be some abstract idea or an idea of a distant land. And I'm hoping that through these stories, they will, it will be closer to That's them right. than right. it appears to be. Yeah. So uh, which contemporary writer, particularly a Canadian writer, or can be anyone actually, uh, has influenced you the most? So... I mean, the first name that comes to my mind is Lawrence Hill. Uh, I mean, he's a big name in Canadian literature. He has been my mentor from, you know, the very early stages of uh, writing this book. And, uh, you know, he, um, he writes about, I mean, his stories are, of course, the, they're different, but at the same time, he also writes about identity and belonging. So um, he's not only influenced me in that sense, but at the same time, he's, He's mentored me in very significant ways in terms of technicalities of writing, how do you write good dialogue, how do you build and develop characters. So I would say he has been the biggest influence. Right, thank you. What about you, Sumaya? In terms of biggest influence? Yes. Okay. Well, I just want to, I realized I didn't get a chance to thank everyone. <laughs> First, I just want to say thank you to the organizers and to everyone who's uh, taking the time to be here today. And thank you to uh, Sreyoshi as well as Subrata Das for inviting me. Um, so to answer your question, uh, so I think there are multiple people that have influenced me when I think about Can Canadian writers uh, from you know, an early age, especially in my university years, I would say definitely Margaret Atwood, Atwood and Anne-Marie MacDonald. At that time, there, there was, weren't many um, writers from other diverse backgrounds that I had come across, but I just remember really resonating with the female protagonist that Margaret Atwood would write about. Um, I really appreciate the way that she talks about the self-alienation of those women, like they find themselves in these external environments that don't necessarily match their internal realities. And they ha there's usually some sort of catalyst, whether it's an internal thought or an external event that happens that drives them on this quest and they have to go and find truth for themselves. And that sometimes means, you know, questioning the very, um, you know, expectations that, that are placed on them or the realities that they've been kind of navigating. Um, so so it's, I just love the way that uh, she does that. Anne-Marie McDonald, I think, subtleties, the way Fall on Your, Your Knees is one of my favorite books uh, because she talks about you know family dynamics but in a very subtle way and and you know the characters they they um, sort of how they develop psychologically I thought that was very well done uh, so those are my two biggest Canadian influences and then you know Sham Salvadore who I worked with at the Humber School for Writers I think the themes that he tackles diaspora uh, duty versus desire always resonated with me for example cinnamon gardens um, I more recently, you know, coming across Nur Naga's work, the, the uh, novel in verse, Wash's Praise, really resonated with me. It was the first time ever that I saw a Muslim female character that was multifaceted, and there was a taboo subject that was being discussed. So that was really resonating with me. I'm like, oh, okay, there are stories like that that are out there. Um, in terms of, like, non-Canadian writers, I love Jhumpa Lahiri because she's so experimental and versatile and she loves playing with language. The fact that she learned Italian and then wrote a 
character, an older exactly. woman, yes. um, you know, who's in, in Italy and, and just like, she's not afraid to take risks. I love that. And Alif Shafak, who is a Turkish writer, I think she's also very experimental. She's done, she has so many different story forms. She writes parallel stories, a story told from the perspective of an inanimate object, um, you know, a story that is told backwards in time. And she also looks at marginalized characters. So overall, I would say, you know, I think what resonates with me, like usually stories about women or marginalized characters and stories that where there's a lot of experimentation um, and, and the writers are not afraid to take risks. Wonderful. Um, so, question to you again. So, how do you, t tell us more about uh, the, uh, your debut memoir. Sure. So, the memoir is called The Shaitan Bride, a Bangladeshi Canadian memoir of desire and faith. And essentially, it's a story about me migrating to Canada at the age of six. So the migration story of that, and then going back to Bangladesh at the age of 19 and facing an attempted forced marriage, and me being confused and sort of, you know, having the carpet rug pulled from under my feet, and, you know, being stuck there for about five months trying to navigate, you know, what, what was going on. And so, um, you know, I eventually find my way back to Canada, not to, not to spoil the story, but when I do return, I'm, I'm back with a lot of philosophical questions about, you know, free will and destiny, about duty versus desire, about, you know, my identity and what, is it, what does it mean to be, you know, a Muslim, um, South Asian, Bangladeshi, first generation immigrant in Canada in living or living in the West. Um, what, what does that mean? What's my connection to, to my ancestry? So some deep, deeper questions around that. So this novel really, or this memoir really explores that. Um, yeah, okay. I think that's a sufficient so, summary. <laughs> right. So uh, how do you deal with the emotional impact, um, you know, of a book on yourself, right? So when you're actually writing it, uh, I'm sure it, it uh, might have triggered you, right? So how do you, how do you deal, how did you deal with that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think, um, I would say, like, I would say that this, uh, writing this really helped me navigate my identity just at, like both at the time, um, like when I look back at the protagonist as a 19 year old, so writing about how I navigated that at the time, but also me as a 30 something year old now writing the memoir. Um, and I think like it, it was interesting, like the process that I used to write the memoir was one of self-examination. So I asked a lot of questions of myself it, throughout the memoir. Um, I named, you know, you were talking earlier about multiple identities and, you know, there's this, this uh, concept called double consciousness that previous writers and sociologists have talked about where they say that, you know, oftentimes racialized individuals, um, they kind of, they have, they have like multiple consciousnesses, like one where it's based on their own inner sense of identity and one that's based on the perception of the other. Of on them, so who, who, uh, so what they think others think of them, and how others view them in society. So there is often a veil in between these two consciousnesses. Usually, people on the other side, like in the dominant society, they they don't necessarily know the lived realities of people who are more marginalized, and then. Um, and they, instead they project ideas onto them about who they are. And then people who are on the other side of it, the marginalized communities, they, sometimes they're not even aware that they're living out these ideas that are being projected onto them. So there's this veil. So I would say, like, the, the approach I took in the memoir was really, you know, thinking about how do I lift that veil um, and ask questions that get me closer to kind of examining what the projections are on me as a Muslim, on me as a woman, um, as me, me as an immigrant. And then of that, how much of that do I reject? How much of that do I accept? What does that mean? And really creating space on the page with these questions so that ultimately I can make choices for myself of how I can reconcile the past with how I want to move forward into the future. So I think kind of just looking at the memoir as sort of this self-examination process. Um, and I wanted to bring the reader along with me on that journey. So um, 
the way I did that was world building. So I, you know, the different contexts I'm in, in Bangladesh or in Canada, I, you know, I talk about things like food, I talk about the relationships, like, you know, experiences I had growing up, so that people can see what some of the norms are, what's, what some of the, you know, um, traditions are in both of those geographical areas and the subcultures in those areas. And then once they do that, they can kind of gain some empathy and understanding for why, you know, certain traditions and norms exist, maybe, like some sort of insight into that. And so, um, sorry, so I would say, like, part of that was also part of that process of lifting the veil and doing that. So anyway, back to what you were saying. Um, in doing all of that, there is a lot of potential for different emotions to arise, you know, because you're looking at really challenging, you know, experiences that, um, and so emotions like anger, guilt, shame, um, vulnerability, like a lot of taboo, stigmatized topics that are coming up. So it can make you feel, you know, quite overwhelmed. And for a person who has experienced, you know, a, a challenging event that has threatened, you know, your sense of safety in the world, you can often feel like you're all these like floating pieces and you don't have like a cohesive sense of self. You don't know how being Muslim fits in with being Canadian, how being a woman fits in, you know, with being an immigrant and whatnot. Like there's all these sort of inconsistencies and dissonances. And so that can, f so when you're writing a memoir, you're kind of being asked to take all of that and put it into a story, into a three act structure, which is really hard when you're trying to find that anchor within yourself. Um, and I would also say sometimes in stories, they're asking you to kind of traditionally look at the hero's journey, right? So what, how does this character go from point A to point B and transform? And in reality, maybe that's not how reality looks like. Maybe you're still embedded in these systems. You're still facing these barriers. How do you tell this empowering, inspiring journey about, you know, this woman who's gone through this experience without you know, kind of minimizing the, the collective responsibility for some of the issues that I talk about, like gender-based violence and racism. So, so all of that comes with these challenging emotions that you're sitting right. with. And so what I told myself was, you know, I'm going to just let it all out on the first draft, and I'll come back in the second draft, and I'll edit. And the process of doing that, I think, was so transformational because even parts of myself that were very critical of myself, it was important for those parts to be voiced because there was a reason yes. why there was that criticism. Absolutely. And that, that is, was part of it was my conscious. And that holds such valuable information for the future. How do you want to make a difference in the world? How do you want to move forward? You, if you walk around the world carrying um, sort of your past with you or carrying you know, these emotions that are latent in your body, then um, it's going to influence how you exist and live your life in the present. So, so I think to, to thinking about it that way, that there, this is going to have a benefit, and, and what is it that, how do I want to take this and move it forward into the future, was one way I dealt with it. Um, I would also say, just to add to that, um, it was important for me to also ground my personal narrative in bigger societal narratives, um, even if, e including mythology and religion. So, you know, you'll notice the title of the book is The Shaitan Bride. So I talk a lot in the story, uh, you know, the concept of um, the shaitan or Satan and who Satan was before Satan became Satan. So in Islamic, you know, philosophy, theology, Iblis, and I offer an alternative perspective. And so even though in the, in the actual story, it, it, that word, you know, shaitan is used in a negative way. It's kind of reclaiming that language for the purpose of, you know, you're kind of reframing the story so it connects more to uh, like a sense of agency. Um, so I think, you know, um, it's just this, this, this process of kind of universalizing uh, some of the, those emotions, but also looking at it in like a broader narrative, externalizing a lot of the internal feelings into an external place um, so that so that other people can also relate to it as well right thank Sorry you so for the much. long answer no 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 <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much it was very well articulated and definitely uh, like you know um, good to hear about your experience and before we uh, move on before we let the audience ask you some question there is a 
I, ha I just have a general question um, any of you or all of you can answer, which is, um, so basically uh, the title of this session is Bengalis in Canadian Literature, right? So I, what, what word of advice do you have or suggestion do you have for exactly those people, Bengalis, writing here in Canada? So, uh, like, you know, it, it, not just about, um, not just about, like, we spoke a lot about the identities and themes, but even the, uh, like, you know, the other aspects of writing, you know, I mean, getting published or peer, like, you know, I mean, what about peer reactions and the need for forums like this? What do you have in mind? Like, what suggestions or advice do you have for aspiring Bengali writers writing here in Canada in English? What are, what are your experiences while, when you were uh, trying to get published here or like, you know, anything in that context that will help uh, writers or do we need such forums? What else do we need and to what extent do we need such? Any word of advice? Yeah, I can I can share a few words. the The publication journey is is definitely not easy, right? But I don't think that should discourage anybody from writing. I think as long as you're right, you're a writer. I think we need to dispel that myth that you need to be published to be considered a writer, right? In order to write to be a writer, you need to write. So I think that's that would be my first piece of advice to just write what you are compelled to write, not just, you know, trying to fit into, you know, what, what will sell or, or what is the trend right now or what are publishers looking for. I just, I think the best stories come out of um, a writer's, you know, compulsion to write what they're called to write. It has to be a calling, right? So I think that's the first step. And then once you have the story and you're ready to share it with the world, then you know you can take it one step at a time, like finding an agent or, and then finding a publisher. I think forums like this are really, really important, <laughs> right? Because that's where we network, we meet other writers, we um, get encouraged. Um, I think mentorship programs are also really important. I know that a mentorship program changed my trajectory, my career trajectory as a writer. Uh, my manuscript was just sitting on my desk and when I um, went through a mentor, that's when, you know, it, it got the attention that it needed, um, the professional advice, and then everything just snowballed after that. So um, those would be, you know, my, my suggestions. Thank you. Uh, to answer your question as to, you know, what advice I would give a Bengali writer, <clears throat> I don't know because I don't come across too many Bengali writers that I, you know, that will take advice from me. So, uh, what I would like to say is that people ask me that, you know, uh, what would you advise me if I had to write, forget Bengali, just a human being. And I tell them that, you know, if you have a story to tell, just do it. Because if you don't, then it'll never get done. The discipline angle is important because, you know, if you, if you don't have discipline, uh, then it's hard to do it, right? I mean, you just can't, you may have the story in your head, but you actually have to do the work. So what I tell them is that, you know, sometimes it's really hard to sit down and write if you're not a habitual writer. So set aside five minutes a day, start with five, and write whatever you can, right? It doesn't have to be in sequence. Just write whatever you feel like. Of course, you know, you have to write what you want to write. And then see, then take a look at it after 10 days, see how it is, right? So if there's a structure, if there's a form, then it'll, you'll see it's easier to build from that as opposed to, you know, trying to figure out the whole thing in your head and then trying to do it. Uh, this is for people who haven't written at all. Uh, I'm trained to do that so I can force myself to sit and write. Uh, and sometimes I don't enjoy it. And because I have, you know, deadlines, I have to deliver things. Uh, but because of the training, it helps. Because I know exactly when to start and when to stop. So that's what I tell uh, new writers or aspiring writers. That, you know, uh, don't overwrite. Uh, try to set a time and tell yourself that this is where I will start, this is where I will finish. So if you need to do research, uh, let's say if you have to submit something in two hours, uh, do a half hour research write for an hour and a half, and that's it. 
don't sit with it, don't rewrite. Because, you know, I, I notice people don't finish their work because they're rewriting too much. And sometimes you can make it better, but then you don't have all the time in the world. So, deadline. Set yourself the deadline, no one else will. Unless they do, then you're stuck, then you have to. But if nobody else is setting you a deadline, just set yourself a deadline and just be at it. That's a very simple way of doing it. Thank you so much. Um, for me, what has been really helpful is being part of writing communities. So that could just even be you know, a, a group in your Toronto Public Library or a group that you form yourself with other people who are interested in writing. I think I actually attended one of your uh, classes, Sam, at the, at the library. Uh, yeah, I, th I think I did. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I think one of the things that's been really helpful with that is just the value of feedback. Because I think as a exactly. writer, you're always going to get all different types of feedback. And so getting used to receiving feedback from other people, but then also sharing your internal thoughts and your process with people sometimes can feel very um, like intimidating or maybe just just like vulnerable. Because um, I think sometimes artists, they hold their work very close to their hearts. So it kind of puts you out there and makes you... Oh, to this. It's probably... Hello? Hello? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, it kind of, uh, kind of helps you develop that skin um, as you're navigating the, the industry. So I really appreciated that. Um, I would also add that for me personally, what has been really empowering in this process is looking back at the heritage um, in Bengali culture of literature and literary arts um, and just how rich and diverse it is. Um, you know, just going back to the Bengali Renaissance and how like literature was used as a way to kind of, you know, face oppression and face colonization and like how do we how do we still carve out our unique identity as Bengalis? Like that's so inspiring to me and I've been even while writing this memoir, I started researching and learning about that because I do get it into a little bit about the history of Bangladesh, the formation of Bangladesh, and even Bengal before, um, like b before 1971 and whatnot. And so, just I started kind of entering into that world when I was writing this, and I've been in that world since. And I've just been so fascinated by the amount of resilience that our community has. And so, whenever I feel like okay, I'm going to go to this like mentor or editor or this publisher with my story or to like whoever. I just kind of remember that where you come from and then I pull strength from that and I say, no, like there is value in what you're saying. Like, you know, your ancestry has so much to offer um, and then kind of using that as a way to to kind of, um, kind of like, really kind of like uh, cheer myself on in the process. And I think also to add to that, when I am working with editors, it, you know, if I feel like there's something about, if I've written about like a cultural experience or, you know, and that it seems to fly over their heads, you know, I take it upon myself to try to share a little bit more information about what that means. Because sometimes the nuances of culture, when you put it on the page, it can, like not be understood by, you know, say a person who's not from the same background as you is reading that story in the editing process. So um, I remember when I was writing this, there were a few times where, you know, there were, there were parts that was like, oh no, actually the reason I wrote this is this. So just kind of taking it upon myself also to, to kind of, um, you know, put myself out there and explain and share. And, and, and yeah, I think that was a really fruitful process for me working with my editor doing that. Wonderful to know that. <laughs> Thank you, all Can three of you. Can I add something, Shreshi, to this? Just a few yes. seconds. Uh, you know, another thing that I notice with uh, new writers or aspiring writers <clears throat> is that, you know, uh, they will listen to a lot of clutter. <clears throat> Sorry. And there is a lot of clutter. So while there is uh, value in um, adhering to some good advice, uh, there is danger in listening to any and everyone. So I think one has to, you know, use some discretion and uh, not you know, delve into each and every idea that comes your way because that's going to dilute your own story. And I've seen that, I've been in workshops, you know, where, you know, you're, you're meant to work in collaboration. Collaboration is amazing if it's the right collaboration. But collaboration could also get toxic because you may not end up writing your own story. You may end up writing 
stories that have, you know, uh, formed in somebody else's head. So you've lost your story somewhere along the way. So it's uh, important to remember that you hold on to your story because that's what you're trying to tell. And while you take good suggestions, you don't go so deep into uh, so many suggestions that you lose your story. So that's another thing. That's wonderfully yeah. said. <laughs> Thank you. And now I open it up for questions from you, dear audience. Um, thanks all for being here. Actually, thanks uh, the panelists, especially Selmi. I just would like to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Riham Ahmed, an Egyptian uh, university professor and current visiting researcher at Guelph University. Actually, I came here to, uh, to conduct my postdoctoral researches on um, Arab Canadian, especially Omar al uh work, but after uh, great and strong suggestion from my host, Professor, uh, Professor Dorsey Wellington, uh, to know more about Selmi. Actually, I just would like to uh, thank you for the amazing book, and thanks for being my cultural key to the um, Bengali and Bangladeshi Canadian literature. I just would like to know more about the very selective and very picky themes you have discussed um, within your eight uh, short stories. For example, the divorcee daughter in the first, in the first one, um, sorry, in the first short story, which is a good family, and uh, also uh, dating a non-Muslim in a secret affair uh, across the ocean, uh, the hyphenation and how does it feel to being a hyphenated citizen? Um, all the adjustments, the cultural adjustments uh, between Canadian and Bangladeshi uh, cultures, familiar journey, um, the third space or the in-betweenness between two different cultural frames and the middle path uh, actually um, the cross-religious uh, and cultural differences and reflections also dating a non-Muslim or the cultural and religious differences between uh, Bangladesh and Canada and the masterpiece home of the floating lily. Uh, and as the, um, uh, the moderator uh, just has mentioned that we are alike more than different. Uh, actually, for me, I felt that it's the Arab counterpart. You know, like it's typically the conservative Arab uh, culture and the conservative uh, religious Islamic community. Uh, my question is, um, do you think that your contribution uh, to the Canadian ethnic community, literary community, I mean, um, is much more different, for example, than the Indian Uzma Jalaluddin, for example. She's talking about the hijab and veil and things like that. Uh, or SK Ali, or, you know, because for myself as a researcher, not just a reader, I uh, classify Selmi's work as uh, like more religious and Islamic work because you are a practicing hijabi woman in the Canadian community. At the same time, you, uh, you still, you are sticking to your cultural norms and cultural roots. So, um, what do you think your contribution in the ethnic Canadian literary community? Thank you so much for your question. It's a great question, actually. Um, I don't know, um, if, when I was writing these stories, I'm not sure I was so conscious about what my specific contribution would be to the Canadian literary scene, except that these were stories that I, I had a burning desire to tell. Like, that was pretty much the driving force behind writing these stories. and. I think regardless of you know, what my values are, my religious or cultural values are, I try to keep that separate from the stories that I'm telling, right? So for me, I think it's very, very important that 
the writer's value system is not reflected in the, the worldviews or the value systems of the characters. It shouldn't feel like it's, it's the writer speaking, right? Um, it should be the characters' voices. It should be the characters' perspectives and worldviews and their, their belief systems. So I've tried to keep that separate. So you will see in the, different, in the eight different stories, there are various themes. So there are, there are families who are more conser conservative. There are families who are more liberal. There are families who have a multitude of um, values and belief systems. They're more, you know, some are more secular than the others. Some have, you know, intergenerational generational conflict with their children where there are different value systems. So I've tried not to stick to, to, to one thing. So I think I'm hoping what the byproduct of telling these stories is that people get to see the community, whether it's the Muslim community or the South Asian community or the intersection of these two communities. My hope is that they see it in all of its complexity and diversity. And I hope that answers your question. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Janatul Naim. I'm a Bangladeshi. Um, just quick, uh, I have a book, just one book, okay? It's a poetry book. Um, I'm, a work, uh, I'm working for Canadian um, municipal government. Um, just uh, wondering if you would give me some insights. How can we um, fulfill the gap that we see um, challenges for the new writers to merge this Canadian literature world? or uh, what would be your one piece of very effective uh, advices to you know, um, connect this society um, where you can see uh, that you are not alienated? That's my question. Thanks. I think any one of you can answer. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I think, you know, there is a lot of exposure these days. So, uh, if one wants to know about other cultures, if one wants to be exposed to, you know, uh, other communities, they can. Uh, we have the internet and we have, uh, if we have the desire to, you know, mix and mingle with many different kinds of people, uh, we can have a varied uh, set of experiences. So, I think uh, as, you know, my colleagues also discussed here that you know if we are focused on writing what uh, we know best, I think there is an audience for that. If it's written well, uh, I don't think. Uh, like personally, I haven't gone uh, seeking for uh, stories that would fill gaps, uh, but that's me, and I have done it. I have written my stories with the belief that they are just interesting stories because they are just stories that everyone can relate to. Uh, like for example, the, my second novel, Human Trafficking, uh, it is all over the place. And you know, for example, when I was at my first, uh, at the book launch, there were so many people who didn't even know that there was human trafficking in Canada. They're like, Canada? That, human trafficking? That's impossible. This is the safest place on earth. They had no clue. So, what I'm trying, again, this is a work of fiction, so I'm not trying to, uh, you know, expose, uh, uh, you know, difficulties in the system. But what I'm just trying to say is that if the story is interesting, then I'm sure there will be a taker. So, that's how I have done it. So, if you have some other, you know, advice that you can give, that's always welcome. But um, my point is, tell a good story, there will be a listener. Actually, maybe our, like, you know, I mean, uh, probably what uh, you were looking for is, like, you know, how the community, uh, in the community, right, you know, what uh, we can perhaps consciously do to, I don't know, I'm, I'm assuming this is what you mean, uh, to kind of uh, mentor emerging writers and, uh, like, you know, because there is always, while I completely agree with you that, uh, uh, write what what you think uh, is best for you, and there will be uh, there will be readers. That's true, but there is also this um, like you know uh, uh, being heard is a big motivator, right? And uh, at times, I wouldn't say like you know in the real world it so happens that uh, like you know I mean I'll just I know that I'm uh, like you know we are already 
past 12.30, sorry about that. I'll just mention one quick thing. I was uh, like, you know, maybe <laughs> not very relevant, but I just remembered something a few days ago. I was reading a post by Taslima Nasreen. I'm sure all of you have, uh, you know her, right? Uh, a uh, very esteemed Bangladeshi um, uh, writer. She she mused on like you know one of the social media platforms that this is a generation of like you know extreme restlessness. People just don't even if you are even if you are my favorite um, author, my favorite poet. If I say something, she made a video of her reading out a poem, and she's saying that I I went to my insights and I saw that. Thousands of people viewed, like they clicked on the link, but they were there for three seconds, right? After that, they left, right? But they, they are all, they proclaim to be big fans of, um, of Taslima Nasreen. So this very, this, this thing of restlessness, people just don't, like, you know, I have so many friends who said that, oh, like, you know, if you're writing, better be short and crisp because, especially if you're going to put on social media because people are not going to read. So that's, I'm like, you know, I mean, uh, uh, motivation is connected to, uh, to others reading, reading your work or uh, like, you know, hearing you. So uh, that probably is a thing that what as a community can we do to, can there be reading sessions? <laughs> I don't know, like, you know, where we can, I can feel safe enough to, maybe I'm not published, maybe not to the larger world, but can I, um, maybe I'm an emergent writer, I still have many uh, like, you know, lapses in my work and whatnot, uh, but can there be a safe space in the community where experienced writers can, like, you know, where I can just read out is, I don't know if that is what she's. I can add a little bit to that, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think there are, there's still a lot that we can do as a community in terms of promoting emerging writers um, and sometimes, so speaking from my personal experience, for example, um, you know, when this book was coming out, you know, I reached out to a lot of South Asian female, like Muslim uh, writers, the ones that are more established or who've had more exposure in the industry and I was just like an emerging writer and um, I actually got a lot more emails back from men and from non-South Asian people and non-Muslims um, and you know as opposed to people that I was hoping to hear from um, so for me that was like a, a moment where I kind of sat with that and I was just like why is that why is that happening um, you know and I think that's one thing you know that sort of kind of just sits with me the other part is I think sometimes like even within our cultural communities, there are these sort of groups, like we kind of stratify ourselves, um, you know, like in the broader, even in the broader Muslim community, I think there's stratification in the broader um, South Asian community, there's stratification. And um, I think, and sometimes it, it like, it can also be a very political thing. There's, there's so much about cancel culture now. There's so much about you know, um, like how, what you're writing, how is that representing uh, a particular community? What do you kind of politically align with or not? Like there's all these nuances and I think sometimes that plays a role and a factor in terms of, you know, whose work gets promoted, whose work gets voiced. And, it, and, and, Absolutely. and if you think about, you know, some of the major like publishers or organizations and, you know, the kind of stories they look for, um, of course they're going, now earlier I was talking about like the double consciousness and how sometimes people in, in realities different from ours, they have projected ideas about us. And so if, if we as a community don't try to empower ourselves and make spaces for people from all di diverse backgrounds within those sub-communities, um, then what's going to happen is that you're going to constantly get the stories that are going to align more with those dominant sort of perspectives and narratives of those organizations are going to be the ones that get told, right? And so you're going to, and this was, I think, in the past, there was a lot of that, right? Like where we, for example, we saw stories of the Muslim woman fleeing um, an abusive, you know, family. And then that was, and that was when I was researching for pre other books, you know, about 
topics that I cover here, that's kind of the narratives that I came across. And so I very consciously was trying to offer a more nuanced perspective of, of that narrative. Um, so it's kind of like that's what's going to happen if we within our communities don't kind of make spaces for a diverse stories. So I think there's a lot to be said for um, you know, the small actions. So whether, whether that be sharing someone's book on social media, um, whether that be you know, arranging for a community meetup for, for people to do readings, whether that be you know, um, connecting someone to another writer or a mentor, like that ground level work within our communities is so important. There's, I think sometimes now there's grants out there for specific you know, communities and I think at a systemic level to some degree that's helpful, but I think we also have a lot of work to do at the ground level. Yeah, within the community, totally. Because, you know, I mean, we need to be heard and I don't think social media is really the platform for that. Like, you know, because uh, as I said, that I feel most people are very, like, you know, they're, they're, uh, they just skim and go. So, so we do need a safe space and a consistent uh, space, maybe, where uh, we can collaborate meaningfully and be heard, whether we are uh, published or not, whether we have one book or none at all. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sorry I, oh, we went a little bit over time. Sorry about that. I think. Uh, Thank you, everyone, and thank you, the panelists. Uh, it was a wonderful session, and it was nice uh, listening to all of your perspectives. Thank you so much. Enjoy the session. Bye-bye.